There's a song that my girls love. Uh, it goes five, four, three, two, one, blast off another rocket ship, gone, something like that. And it says like, "Take me to the moon, take me to the stars." And so I, I sang to my daughter. Uh, I said, "Take me to the sun." <laughs> <laughs> and she immediately started singing, when I get there, I'll be burning everywhere. <laughs> like, that's my daughter. That's my girl. <laughs> the glass is half empty. <laughs> so, you know, no, the one I always said is, um, to me, the glass is always half full of poison. Right? No. <laughs> <laughs> the third yeah, the, way. But it says the glass is all empty. Yeah, the glass isn't there, right? <laughs> so... The Rings of Power, which I, many podcasts back, was excited about because I was really hoping to see like a book of Sauron. I wanted to see the story of Sauron, which I think the Rings of Power tried to do in a way that totally mangled the Silmarillion. I know you only made it through three episodes. I saw the whole first season. And I think that there were good things about it, but in general, it was amazing how much they took liberties with the original texts. I mean, with the Silmarillion, but I think even with the, uh, the appendixes that they, that they were allowed to draw from, they weren't allowed to draw from the Silmarillion. And I was sort of startled by it. I was also startled by the, uh, Galadriel's transformation into this warrior elf, which didn't seem to fit her character at all. No, I don't remember that at all. So that was really really strange and then Gilgalad I thought was very odd the whole situation with the dwarves um, and the Southlands I mean I think the only cool thing was the transformation of the Southlands into Mortar but I think you didn't make it that far I sort of I sort of got a hint of it um, yeah I was I was you know as I've mentioned before I'm not a big fan I mean the the Jackson films are fun yeah I think they're fun movies I just don't think they're the Lord of the Rings. Hmm. Um, yeah, I, I just don't. I don't know. I feel like they were f- pretty faithful. I mean, they left a couple of things out that I that I, they probably just had to, but I didn't feel like I felt like the depiction of the Shire oh, the f- was great. Of no, the, the fa- great. they're faithful to the plot, but th- their whole it's it's a ama- I mean, it's a fascinating question. I mean, they are in, in, the. The movies were incredibly faithful to the plot, but to me, they're in t- they are so completely antithetical to what the Lord of the Rings is about. And I've how I've, so? I've, already, how you, I've said this before. I mean, I've spat the the Lord say of the it Rings. Again. Nobody nobody listens to all. Nobody of Nobody listens anyway. Okay, great. The Lord of the Rings is part of a very long history of British thought and. I, I don't know if I should be using the word British or English, but English thought and English literature um, that incorporates a lot of writers in the later half of the 1800s and the early part of the 1900s. Right. And so William Morris, who uh, William Morris, who's a famous character, and I and I think everybody should should at least know something about the life of William Morris, was one of the founders of uh, the arts and crafts movement. Right. Um, which was part of a much broader movement taking place in Europe in the later half of the 1800s. And what was happening in the later half of the 1800s is that everybody was waking up and saying, hey, industrialization is here and it's going to obliterate everything. Right. Um, that the industrial world is in a sense. Go ahead. You want to? Sorry. No, I mean, you definitely did touch on this particular thing. And it is, it is in the first season, episode eight or something like that. And we did talk a lot about the books and the arts and crafts movement and the sort of fear in the British Isles of industrialization and what would happen, and you totally do see that in the books. And I agree that that is not really depicted in the spirit of the Peter Jackson films. Not at all. And it's about I, fight scenes, and there's very few, there's very little yeah. fighting in The Lord of the Rings. I mean, as we've joked, and I'm sure we've said this a hundred times, most of The Lord of the Rings, you know, what's the most common thing? It's description of landscape. That's right. It's every every flower and weed. <laughs> It's an elegy. To (laughs) me, the Lord of the Rings is Tolkien's elegy, eulogy, to an England that probably was already gone by 1880, but certainly was gone, and certainly serving in the First World War, and the horror of that turned him into an ardent 
anti-technology, I mean, just really an anti-technology, much like Ray Bradbury. Strangely enough, Ray Bradbury yeah. was was very much uh, very, very doubtful of modern times and very, very doubtful of technology and industrialization. Mm -hmm. um, and the same thing with with Tolkien. It's a it's a eulogy. And when you read the Silmarillion, I mean, it's some of the most beautiful prose is that that thing that the, the British are so great at, which is describing a landscape, you know, and mm -hmm. the marshes and the misty covered moors um, and the forest and walking through a forest and how the branches are tangled and, and getting off on trees and stuff like that. I mean, the actual sword play <laughs> in The Lord of the Rings <laughs> could probably fit on like 20 pages. Well, there are and, some beautiful battle scenes described, especially the riders of Rohan um, riding into the defense of is it Isengard. Is that um, no, no, that, it's, uh, some, Minas Tirith, and it's Minas that Tirith, is beautiful. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's that's the great. I mean, that's the one play. That's the the great. I yeah, mean, the battle the of Pelennor Fields. That yeah. that chapter is yes. That's that's swords. That that's a that's sword play, and that's and and that was it. But. You know, the whole thing about, you know, the, the whole thing about the orcs tearing up Isengard, that gets like a half a page, you know, in the two towers. Um, and so it's just, it's it's really lost. To me, it was just so much more about, um, the, the movies were just so much more about battles and things like that. And that's not what the Lord of the Rings. Yeah, Lord, Lord it's of the Rings big is, screen, you know. I mean, it's Hollywood it's a movie. and it's big screen. And, and yeah. You're, you know, if you made a movie about the horticulture of, of J.R.R. Tolkien, I imagine it would not do quite as well. No, as, it wouldn't. Uh, as, it, as it did. Yeah. Um, but that is a far cry from what happens in Rings of Power, which oh, is... Oh, the Rings of Power is just a joke. Takes, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, my God. It's like 3,000... They take 3,000 years of, of story that's in the Silmarillion and they condense it down to about three weeks. And uh, I get why they did it, but it... it it's that at that point it becomes a little upsetting. It really feels like you've taken such a departure from the original ideas in in yeah. order to turn it into a TV series. I don't think it, they ever departed. It just feels abusive. I don't think there's any yeah. departure. My guess is they already, you know, they already had some stock plot which could be a and they said, hey, you know, if we associate this with the name of J.R.R. Tolkien, it'll sell a lot more tickets. Right. But honestly, the plot in there has nothing to do with the Silmarillion. It has nothing. It really doesn't. Um, it's there's nothing there, um, and there wasn't much there to begin with. Honestly, as I as we as we've talked about before, the Silmarillion is not a tightly wrapped package. J.R.R. Tolkien did not sit down and write a book called the Silmarillion and hand it to his publisher. The Silmarillion is a collection that I think was put together mainly by Christopher Tolkien. Yes, um, and. And it's some of it, and a lot of it is in more, you know, better condition than other parts of it. It's bits and bobs, and it's a bunch of stuff glued together. And so, you know, I think <laughs> I think people are just rummaging through the bins is what they're doing. And I just I and I just didn't like it, and I didn't like the acting, and I didn't. It just seems so. It just seems so bad. <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell you. It just seems so average. The entire thing is just all the ideas, all the visuals, all the dialogue, all the acting was just so average. Um, yeah. And so yeah. I, I, I turned it off. Well, I was I so I've just uh, recovered from COVID and I had two weeks where I really wasn't able to work very much. And so I watched a lot of TV and. And that was one of the things that that I watched. My brother also recommended a really great series on Netflix uh, called, well, because I love making pizza, it's uh, Chef's Table Pizza. And it's about these different chefs basically focusing on this one dish, this, this you know, lowbrow dish of pizza and perfecting it. And I found that really fascinating. But I really couldn't find much else. Um, that, was, that was really compelling. I know you would like me to watch a series called Dairy Girls. Yeah, right? I, it's okay. It's it's fun if you yeah. if you if you got an Irish background. It's a little easier to understand some of the inside jokes inside mm. of it. But fundamentally, it's it's fairly lowbrow, but it is funny and it's and it's very finite. It's three seasons, and I think there's like six or seven episodes per season, and it's definitely working up towards a climax, which is the signing of the Good Friday Peace Accords that brought peace to Northern Ireland. Right. Um, and it takes place in the the city of of Derry, 
which the English renamed Londonderry, but it's dairy um, in Northern Ireland, which has a fairly a fairly violent history in the t- mm-hmm. in in the story of the Troubles, which began in sixty nine and continued up until the the Good Friday Accords. But the the show itself, ninety nine percent of it is really. Just really ridiculous, stupid slapstick humor. It's really funny. It's just a bunch of high school age girls and one guy who are constantly getting into stupid trouble. And there's and and so I just like it because I like it. I felt good watching it. It made me laugh. Yeah. And I didn't I didn't it wasn't somebody shooting, you know, it, it didn't have guns in it. And that it was didn't the have amazing... dismemberment and it doesn't yeah. have sexual assault in it. Rape. It doesn't have, yeah. you know, it doesn't ha- it doesn't happen after the comet hits the earth or, you know, everything <laughs> the boils moon the collides. ocean. The co- moon yeah. smashes it. You know, it was just yeah. like it's it's it was it was glee- blissfully free of all the disaster tropes that we have in modern television so but it's not it's not any great work of art um but it's a lot of fun i thought it was funny i and it, it sort of tickled i'm in i may be a little more tickled than most because of sort of the irish connection um but you live in boston and so there's a huge oh, irish yeah, connection and, I, and your I'm mom is half irish so. right your mom so you might get a get a little bit of a hoot out of it yeah yeah, yeah. so worth a visit I'm looking forward to it. I mean, I, I'm happy to see anything that isn't about um, hired killers, um, yep. medieval style battle with dragons, superheroes. All of that. Right? At this uh, point, I'm just like, uh, oh, the misanthropic stories, you know, and and just just kind of the, I don't know, it, it, the darkness. I mean, I am I'm usually a big fan of dark, but I feel like now on. In terms of what's available to watch on TV, it's you can't, you just can't throw your shoe without hitting dark. <laughs> I'm sick of it. I want something. I just want a balance, you know. Yeah, um, something. So, and I know I'm not ready enjoyable. to watch the home improvement shows or somebody winning an award or a contest. That the contest stuff, I can't stand no, either. But no, yeah, so no. I, I'd like to see good storytelling that isn't about sexual assault. You know, on, honestly, <laughs> just just something. Something without blood. Crazy. Yeah, I told you I was watching uh, the, I th- this uh, this movie that everybody that a lot of people would talk about, the Northman or the Norseman or something like that. And I got like three quarters of the way through it, and, I, and I, this has been happening more and more to me. I'm like, why am I watching this? Like, what right. is this movie doing for me? Nothing. Okay, well, turn it off. Let's go do something else. So well, it's true. And we anyway, let the stories in. We let these stories inhabit us. You know, when you when you follow them, you're you're sort of you're choosing to, to to let something into your psyche and, and have it become part of you, and, and I think it's yeah. I think it's wise not to to ch- to choose more wisely, but there isn't a lot to choose from. I think I think is the thing. So speaking of dark, I did just finish a great series of books that I know you read a long time ago, that I really did I really did enjoy, and honestly, it doesn't get much darker than these books, but I thought it was done in a in a really I, th- I felt like it was a pretty masterful way, with some exceptions. And it's uh, N.K. Jemison's The Broken Earth series, um, also recommended to me by my brother, uh, that I thought was I thought was really, really great. And it's about like thousands and thousands of years from now, after a series of ecological catastrophes on a scale that we're not even contemplating now, that involve uh, kind of messing with the tectonic plates in a very seriously bad way that that does a number of really awful things to the earth in which at which point people refer to earth as father earth and evil earth because the earth is constantly killing people um, with eruptions and and earthquakes and um, well magma um, and ash and each of these events come around, like, say, once every thousand years, and they're called a season, and they never know how long the season will take. Do you remember some of this? What I remember is that the protagonist was a young lady. hmm Okay? And, she, uh, you know, spoiler alert, I guess. I mean, she has the power to, she has some kind of inherent magical power over the earth. And she goes to right. the school where they train the people who can do this kind of stuff. That there are certain people who can right. 
affect the earth and she goes there and then and then her wild and wacky travels and i think eventually it's revealed it has something to do with the moon um that's sort of the big reveal that you know, we got to put the moon that is back that in is place. The, yeah, you've just given away the the, yeah, the, well. the climax of book one right but yeah um, the um you can edit it out if you yeah. want to, I guess. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the earth, the earth is the earth is angry. Okay, so we're talking, and she and she goes to the school, and she meets this very, you know, this very sort of doomed, very uh, a very intriguing character, uh, a man who has great powers. He has uh, the rings, right? There's it, your, that's right. Your he's ten status, rings. yeah, yeah. The status within the society is how many rings you have, and she has a very stormy uh, relationship with him. Um, and yeah, it's starting to come into focus. And then there's something about where they go sail on an island. There's pirates. I, I don't know. Um, there are pirates. It's true. And, yeah. Uh, one of, some of the characters that I like are the guardians. The guardians are, are there to control the ragas or the origins that have this control over the, the earth's, uh, I don't know how to, do, they're sort of over the movement of the tectonic plates of the earth. They have some control of, of, um, the, the God, the, you know, the movement of lava or the movement of magma under the earth, right? And uh, it's it, it's it, what I found fascinating was just that, like, kind of the the scope of it was so far into a potential disastrous future, and the culture was was nicely built out. That uh, you kind of got this sense that um, the origins were hunted uh, and feared. And as soon as they would show signs of, you know, having that talent, even shortly after birth, they would be killed. And so the the school would would send out the guardians to try to find them before they were killed by the. By right. the That's how it begins. People. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 And yeah. it is, you know, I, it is great. It doesn't, it doesn't explain anything right away. Right. So the, the, one of those things where you're really wandering in the wilderness for a while. And so you can get your bearings, which is something I also really love um, at the start of start of these these books. But it's fundamentally I think by the end more, of the trilogy, it starts to wind down. Yeah, yeah. I think I made it through two books. I'm not sure. Maybe I mm -hmm. made it through one and a half books. But that I was reading at a different time in my life. I was reading it probably like 15 years ago, and I was in a completely different place 15 years ago than I am now. Uh, but I just remember it just being, uh, and it's true of a lot of authors that I read. It's just. It's just, I don't mean the word oppressive, but it's mm -hmm. just something where it's just smothering. The language is sm and it's just relentless. And and I don't know, because I read another set of hers, which is about these gods who, you know, the gods live at the base of this really, they live in this enormous tree. Um, and there's a city around the base of the tree and the wild and wacky adventures of some her heroine. And it's just, it was the same thing. It was just sort of, it was just like, where is this Heroin going? Heroin had magical powers uh, also. Everybody has, that. I don't know. I don't know, but yeah. it's just, yeah, everything is like dread, and there's a lot, and this is sort of also true of like um, China Mieville, who wrote um, Perdido Street Station. Yeah, yeah. And the, su the successors to that, which became even more, they just, these worlds that they create are just not very happy places, and it just, and they just keep pushing it down on you. And everybody, you know, and, and everybody has to face enormous odds and enormous ridicule and enormous criticism and be, you know, discriminated against and abused and physically assaulted. And it's just, again, it's the same thing. It's just like, yeah, okay. I'm, <laughs> I don't know. I just, I, I like the book where it's just not that 24. I mean, that's why, um, you know, a good antidote to that is, uh, you know, is Vonda McIntyre, you know, the dream mm -hmm. snake, the one that we talked about a lot earlier, which was like, I think one of the first Hugo awards or Nebula award winners awarded to a, a female author. Um, mm -hmm. It's got a certain lightness to it. You know, it's yeah. not, it's not totally grinding. And I know you didn't like Samuel R. Delancey for probably a lot of the same reasons that I'm talking about now. I mean, talk about oppressive books. Dahlgren definitely is. Up yeah. It's there. one of the more oppressive uh, uh, dense tomes. Uh, I, I, Delaney, I'm not, uh, you know, I haven't read enough Delaney, honestly. I, I need to read more yeah. of them. Um, but because if you start why, with Dahlgren, maybe, I mean, really. 
Yeah, you should start with Nova. I mean, there's definitely an arc to Delaney where he starts out as just another amazing science fiction stories writer. And Nova Mm -hmm. is like written by a completely different person. Um, Much in the same way that, you know, we talked recently. I did read, I read a couple of his. I realize now I did read a couple of his. But see, they didn't. You tried the Einstein intersection and you didn't like it. Yeah. Yeah, I I recommended the Einstein. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't dig it, uh, but that's the way it goes. Uh, he's, you know, he's one of the greats, and I and I, I, I look forward to digging in further. Nova, yeah. I'll, you know, that that would be one. And I still haven't read uh, Vonda McIntyre, so that's that's something I'm looking forward to. Oh, you should read the Von. It's it's really, you know, um, it, it's it's it has it has that it has the traveling. It's very much like Ringworld. You have the traveling hero who mm-hmm. must use who must use cleverness. Um, to get out of stuff, but it's not, you know, it's not like whirring, you know, razor blades all the time. It's, 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 you know, it's not this thing where the earth is going to explode all the time. Um, it's just somebody who's traveling in a landscape, meeting new people, trying to figure, trying to solve puzzles. Um, it's like we talked about before. A lot of it is just Odysseus. How do I get back home? I'm out here. I have adversities. How do I get back home? And can it be, Interesting. Can it be clever? You know, and that's right. why everybody loves Odysseus. It's not an oppressive story because he is the trickster. And therefore mm-hmm. he comes up with really clever solutions to survive um, and how to get back home. So that's right. He's not Achilles. He's not Ajax. He's he's one who uses his wiles. That's right. Um, to achieve his, his ends. And that, that's an interesting, that, that is something for me to remember actually in my own writing because I feel like that is sort of where I'm heading with with some of my uh, my last book in the series that I'm writing, uh, which is more of a you know a, a wanderer and a sense of not only trying to get back home but trying to decide what home is. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, yeah, that's that's great, and it, I feel like that has some ring to Station Eleven too, which uh, of all the things that I've seen on. Uh, the 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 you know the streaming television that one and the treatment of foundation I thought was also really good because it wasn't about con- you know we weren't moving from violence to violence we were moving the plot forward really right. developing the character arcs of each of the individual characters and I thought that was really beautifully done. Um, well, speaking of what's coming to streaming, uh, oh, for the very first uh, time, an author, well, I mean, not I mean, there have been movies made of his work. Right. But I, you know, yeah, I think this is the first time they've taken a novel and actually made a movie or a series about it. I know there, there, were, there were other movies that were made sort of generally about either a short story or about- Johnny Mnemonic. Johnny Mnemonic. Was that the only one? I, that's not what I know of. Yeah, yeah. So the peripheral is is coming to Prime, and I've seen a couple of the previews, and it looks really promising. Promising. I mean, yeah. Although Prime is also the organization that created Rings of Power, so I hope but they're they also the organization that created the Expanse. So that's true. You know, true. I give it even money. They bought uh, the Expanse. Really Wasn't good. that a Canadian? Was that a that was a another production company? I think. Well, they all use it. They all. It's not like they're using their own production companies. They're they're hiring out. Um, right. In my understanding, they're hiring out to other production companies. So, uh, I hope this is a faithful telling. It looks a little action packed, which is concerning. But um, uh, you know, there's a there's lot, a lot of action in the peripheral. Yeah, there is. That's true. That's true in yeah. both timelines. Yeah, but, yeah, so but I'm it's really also excited. more I think it's than like, it's more than just the action. It's about you know it's about the characters in the kind of socio economic situations that they reside, mm-hmm. and the threats that they face. But also you know the way those systems are trying to preserve themselves. It's yeah. So I'm definitely. I'm very excited for it. I want to see what they do with it. I think I think a lot more people um, have to read that book. Um, another thing um, I've been reading recent. So on my on my nightstand, um, 
I have a book about who I've never read about, which is the Marquis de Lafayette. It was oh. recommended to me by my former brother-in-law, Dwight David. And I said, what are you reading? He says, I'm reading. He's, he, he said he really likes uh, Duncan. There's this uh, author, this guy who started a podcast. His name is Duncan. He started a history podcast. Um, hmm. And I think his original one was about Rome. And he started mm-hmm. a podcast about Rome. And it became really big. And then he started writing books. And he created The Storm Before the Storm. Um, mm-hmm. which is a history of Rome, home, a history of the Roman Republic. Um, and now he's written a book, A Hero of Two Worlds, which is a history of the Marquis de Lafayette, which I never really, I knew. Uh, yeah. So, no, I, I, I'm thinking that uh, our friends at History Happy Hour, Rick Beyer and uh, Chris Anderson, I think they had him on. I'm just looking. I'm searching. You can keep talking. That's fine. And it's it's fascinating because, you know, as as school kids, we all learned the name of Marquis de Lafayette. He was a French guy who joined the revolution. And he, along with mm-hmm. von Steuben, and they, you know, they were part of the Continental Army and they made everybody feel good and, you know, and, they're, and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, that's all I remember. Um, reading this yep. book, it's really, really, really interesting what was going on. Um, he is, uh, the Marquis de Lafayette was 19 years old. Uh, he was born by chance shortly after he was born by a series of unusual chances. He basically wound up as the richest, one of the richest noblemen in France. Um, people through various inheritances and people dying. He was really magnificently wealthy. Um, mm-hmm. and, uh, he, he wanted to be in the army. He wanted to, you know, like a nobleman, he wanted to serve in the army. And so he went in, as was common at the time, he he was placed in a very high position, even though he was very young and had no military experience. He was basically made a very high military officer because he was a very wealthy and very well-connected nobleman. And then about uh, shortly after, he saw very little action um, in the army. And then yeah. shortly thereafter, um, there was a shakeup and there was a reform of the military and, a and the King hard, uh, put this guy in charge of the military who said, the first thing we're going to do is get rid of all these stupid noblemen who don't know which end of the sword, sword to stick in somebody else. And the Marquis de Lafayette was cut mm. and he was kicked out of the army. Um, and very depressed um, had a had a wife living now in Paris and trying to figure out what he's going to do. Um, and then through a series of, of circumstances, he comes in contact with uh, uh, the Americans. Uh, Silas mm-hmm. Dean, who was an American representative um, in Paris. Um, he met Benjamin Franklin um, and he said, I want to join up. And he was not the only one. There was a lot of French noblemen, a lot of French professional soldiers who were hoping to cash in on the American Revolution and go over there and make some money fighting against the British. Um, and so he got on a boat. Um, and actually, he got on his own boat. He bought his own boat because mm-hmm. he was that wealthy. And he says, I'll buy my own stuff. And he bought his own boat and he went over. Um, and I don't want to give away the whole book. It's it's that's a fascinating part of the story. And he went over there. He w- wasn't in many military actions, but everybody loved him, especially George Washington. He and Washington developed a very close relationship, um, and he survived. Um, and and it's a fast. It's really a good story. It's only about you know 100 pages, but it's really worth reading huh. because he seems really kind of clueless lots of times. The Marquis de Lafayette. It's like, hey, this is great. I'm 19. I'm going to go over to America. Right. And we're going to yeah. and we're going to do this, and we're going to go invade Canada. Which Typical rich things. kid. Yeah, out he on was, adventures. Yeah, but everybody loved him. Everybody still mm-hmm. loved him. Everybody thought he was great. You know, they said, yeah, he's compl- you know he's a total doofus, but we we just love him. He was tall. He was athl- you know he was kind of he was kind of clumsy, but. Um, uh, it's interesting. He he immediately says, "Okay, hold a second. We're fighting for liberty here. Why does everybody have slaves?" Yeah, and that yeah, and yeah. and he actually You're just like, "Oh, look at the time." Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, no, they did, and he yeah. and and at the end of the uh, end of the Revolutionary War, he sent all these letters to to Washington saying, "So, what about this idea of mine of freeing all the sl- of manumission?" <laughs> yeah. And I, Washington all right, it sounds like a it sounds yeah. like a great book, but I do want to say, I mean. Um, 
uh, Rick Beyer and Chris Anderson did interview Mike Duncan mm-hmm. at HistoryHappyHour.com. Uh, we're not going to get Mike Duncan on our podcast, so I want to refer people there. Um, Rick is a good friend, and uh, their podcast is fantastic. Um, it's not actually out in audio, you, but you can watch the YouTube videos of it. And uh, that's his- HistoryHappyHour.com, uh, episode 82, and I'll put a link on our website uh, in the show notes. Yeah, and I think this this book, Hero of Two Worlds, probably mm. is a is probably an excellent book on tape. Like the way it's written, probably rolls off the speakers really well. It's not a dense book. It's meant to be very very fast paced. Um, so anyway, just re- wrap it up briefly. I'm about halfway through, but then there's yeah, the yeah. second thing where he comes back. He comes back to France just in time for the French Revolution to kick off, oh. um, and he gets and swept he- up into them. Oh, he gets totally swept up into it. Meaning on on which side? Um, he the 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 events the the events leading up to the French Revolution are fairly complex, and there's a lot of them. But one of the key events that happened, you know, the French the 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 real trigger for the French Revolution was that the the French government was broke; they were mm-hmm. out of money, mm-hmm. um, and. In order to address this, they're either going to have to call the Estates General, they're going to have to do this, they're going to have to do that. And what they said is we're going to call together, uh, I think it's like 140 notables. We're going to have the Council of Notables. I probably have the number wrong, but they're going to call the notables. And Marquis de Lafayette was one of the notables called up. And they right. call these notables in. Basically, they said you know, what they were expecting to do, what the king's men were expecting to do, is saying, hey, we're broke, and this is what we're going to do. We're going to levy these taxes. We're going to levy this tax. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And instead, yeah. the notable said, hey, how about this whole idea of, you know, what's the king's power and why don't we have a constitution in France? <laughs> so and and everybody and the, the king's people <laughs> were like, oh, my God, that's not the agenda. Come the agenda dude. is we've got to pay the bills and this is how we intend to do it. And are, and are you going to rubber stamp this or not? And they said, we're not doing anything until we address some really fundamental issues here because very, the- re- very reminiscent of, of King John and the. Uh, and the nobles at the time in 1155 yep. before the Magna Carta that sort of forced him into a corner and said, you're going to sign this thing. <laughs> and, right. uh, or, you know, or basically we're not going to work for you anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's, that's, it's funny. I mean, um, I, I definitely, I don't know how I got onto King John and the Magna Carta, but I just started, you know, I just started going through Wikipedia um, on, uh, on that subject. I think I was looking up the Magna Carta for, just a breakfast conversation with my daughters. And um, I mean, one of the things that people don't understand is that King Richard was awful. He was like a terrible king. Yeah. And king John was seen as a terrible king because he continued the taxation that was started under King Richard, during which everyone loved, you know, they just loved him so much because he was like this fighting, jousting yeah. camp champion who's going off to the Crusades. He was never home. He wasn't yeah. governing at all. And then he got, I think he got killed in a joust and then his brother's king and they're like, He's like, okay, same taxes. And they're like, oh, no, screw that, man. <laughs> that's, that's totally unfair. He's like, what, my brother, what? So, yeah, um, yeah I mean, so that's what, very similar. That's what happens at the beginning, you know, and then things start going off the rails. And Lafayette thinks, you know, he's, a, he's, a, he's a, uh, an enlightenment ideologue. He's like, this is going to be wonderful. We're going to we're going to sweep away all these cobwebs, and we're going to put France on a firm footing. And la la la. What he doesn't realize is that the only reason you can say that is because you're basing it upon the assumption that you're a nobleman and you get to call the shots. Mm-hmm. And what they don't realize is that there's the mob. Yeah. And not only is there the mob, which is an unfortunate word, there is, but there is, there is the people who are not nobles. And more importantly, yeah. more importantly than there being people not nobles, there are people who know how to manipulate the people who are not nobles. And right. so that's when you start getting people like, uh, uh, of course, his name just flew out of my head, but the the famous guy from the from the terror. Um, oh, Rose, this is, thank you. Um, yeah. You know. You have these people who can manipulate the mob, and yep. they're in control now. And that's so what's happening is, to Lafayette. This is fascinating because it goes back to a conversation I had with um, with a fellow Haverfordians, uh, Matt Rosen, who definitely feels, in general, that you know pub, public upper, uprisings of the hoi polloi are generally manipulations by 
people who are, well, people who are pulling the strings, people who have more power and usually more money uh, that are that are somehow behind it. He, he goes through it in terms of the Russian Revolution. It's not really just a general public uprising, uh, but there were many, many interests at work that pulled mm-hmm. that off. You know, these, these anti-authoritarian, anti-monarchy revolutions have at the base, I don't know, are they rabble-rousers? Are they sort of, you know, are they, I, I'd have to look further into it. It's what, hard to tell, you know. Was he was he noble or was he just a no? He was, was a noblesse de la robe. So there's the noblesse, de, uh, the 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 nobles of the sword who are sort of like the old and the OG nobles. Okay, yeah. to use a common term. And then what you had in the past few hundred years in France was the rise of the nobles of the robe, um, which for people who are not who are not the military. Um, landed estates. They were the new bourgeoisie who were the lawyers um, yeah. and the the bureaucrats and stuff like that. And they, the bourgeoisies, we call them, and they started rising up. And that's what Robespierre was. He was a lawyer from Arras. Um, and so I think what, you know, good question. Who's in charge? I wouldn't be surprised if one possible answer is nobody's in charge right. and everybody gets swept up and that people, you know, people, you know, find themselves riding a wave. Um, mm-hmm. And this ties into the whole thing, the thing that I've said before 600 times, which is the the quote that begins, all the light we cannot see. Mm-hmm. It's a quote from Goebbels, um, the, the Nazi propaganda minister, right. an unusual person to open your book, <laughs> an unusual person to select a quote from. <laughs> but basically the quote said, Goebbels said, if we didn't have radio, we'd be nothing. The Nazi party would have been nothing. Right. He said it was it was radio and our ability to manip- uh, the fact that we understood what radio represented and we could use it. Yeah, that's true. And how about Twitter? Well, and that's you know whenever or the printing press. I mean, whenever right. whenever mass communication becomes possible, there's a positive and negative effect. And is it good in general? I mean, should we all be luddites? Should we? Should we go back to, I don't know, writing Can't. stuff out by hand? Uh, is that a way to escape the negative effects of mass communication, of interconnection? Or is, and maybe, you know, I, now I'm like, oh my God, I've got to rewrite my whole, i got to rewrite my trilogy. But um, you're right. I mean, the, the, the Nazis would have been nothing without the ability to reach the masses via the airwaves. Well, they, would, they would have been different. Mm. They may still have been perfect little pricks but yeah. you know would they have had the same thing the the fastest what i've heard is that the fastest rate of killing in the history of mankind was the hutu tutsi slaughter during rwanda and that yes. was coordinated over fm radio like it over was. fm radio they said go to this town they're over here go over there that's where they i are. recommend uh, a book if, if the listeners haven't read it i don't know if i still have my copy i think i lent it out um, a book, and I forget the name of the author, it's called Left to Tell. She, she was a survivor of the Rwandan genocide, and she, um, she wrote about it. Uh, and her account is just, it's horrifying. It's super, super chilling. But I think it's a really important account uh, to, to, to read, Left to Tell. It's very religious, and it's very rooted in her, in her faith, but it's a, it's a, critical account uh, from the inside of an actual genocide. And um, if you can find it, uh, it's a really good read, a really important read. So uh, again, to the, to the, the point is, is that, you know, a guy like Lafayette, he's in control until he's not Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. until somebody comes along who can, who can use the new force um and and set the agenda for you and no longer you know you have a nobleman who wants to change what what the power is of the nobleman well that's kind of problematic because that's why you're making decisions about how you want to change the society right here comes somebody else they have a different idea and they're not another nobleman so it's not like the discourse is going to remain the same here's somebody coming along 
and he can already feel that he can already he can already sense like he's he's named so the the french revolution goes in very you know there's the tennis coat tennis court oath there's this there's that there's a very well established chronology the, the 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 storming of the bastille they're all in a very known sequence and he gets named as um the person to maintain um peace he basically runs the militia of Paris. He's nominated. Mm-hmm. He's appointed as the person to run the Paris militia and maintain order on the streets. Um, and so he's there to protect the Parisians, but he's also there to advance the agenda of the National Assembly, which has sort of magically, you know, magically arisen. You know, there is the calling of the notables that blows up. Then comes the calling of the Estates General that metastasizes into this guy gets up and says, we're a National Assembly. We are now the government of France. And everybody's like, <laughs> you yeah. know, and then and then everything Every, everything continues to go sideways. And so now people are just making things up. They're making it up as they go along. And he's a member of the old regime in charge of the police, you know, the militia of Paris. And you can tell he's already, he already figures that he doesn't hold the tiger by the tail anymore. Right. Um, so, but I got to read more of it, but it's, I think it's a worthwhile book. I think it's very interesting. To, it's a very interesting, that first third of it about him going to America um, is fascinating. It really is. And it really, it says a lot about the American Revolution, which is that like the vast majority of people in America were totally unconcerned about the Revolutionary <laughs> War. Um, and, you know, and uh, everybody's, ass- and, and the, the central place of land speculation, um, of slavery, um, you know, all, all the mechanism, all the economic mechanisms that were going on at that time. Anyway, so that's uh, Hero Two Worlds. Good book. Load of laughs. Load of laughs. Well, Lionel, this is our, we're going to try this experiment of trying to keep it under 45 minutes. And okay. so um, that unfortunately that forces me to make a hard stop. What, um, so we've, but we've got, uh, we've got a bunch of reading recommendations here. Let me see if I can, if I can, okay, so N.K. Jemison, Broken Earth series, uh, Vonda McIntyre, what was Green the name Snake. Of that? Yeah. Dream Snake, Dream Snake which we've recommended before. Uh, the Peripheral, if you haven't read it. And then Agency is the follow-up book for that. It's an interesting follow-up. It's not your typical follow-up kind of book, uh, which is then also, if you read that before it comes out on Prime, then you'll be prepared. And Hero of Two Worlds, Marquita La- Lafayette. All right. Cool. And you'd, um, so you'll have all of these uh, read by the time we do our next podcast, which may be in a week. We've been a little slower recently. Part of it has been COVID on my part. Part of it has been your working situation right. changing, um, trying to find the, the times. And uh, if you have any ideas for guests you think we can actually get on our tiny little podcast, please send them our way. You can tweet at Jim and Ventino, And I think you can send it to podcast at bigego.com, but I'm not sure. Um, anyway, tweet at Jim and Ventino. Uh, if you want, if you have any ideas for guests, or you can support us on Patreon, and then you can interact with me all the time. It's patreon.com slash Jim Infantino. Anything else to add, nope. Lionel? Any ideas? Nope. I think it's mm-hmm. good enough for a day's work. Yeah. Okay. Good talking to you, man. Arrivederci. Dude. Dude.